A few years ago, when we changed uh, to a new contract, our 10th scope of work, CMS decided that they wanted, rather than just a regular kind of collaborative model, they wanted something a lot broader and a lot bolder. And so they embraced the concept of a learning and action network uh, that will bring together um, bring together healthcare professionals, and it's all about an improvement initiative. This is one of my favorite um, sayings from Ben Franklin, when you're finished changing, you're finished, and, and that's an understatement. And we're, everybody in this room is all about change and changing for the better. All right, so LANs are improvement initiatives, convening healthcare professionals and stakeholders. Oftentimes they can and should include patients and or consumers. Um, we're convened around an evidence-based agenda, and with our collaboration, we have peer-to-peer -peer knowledge transfer and sharing of best practices, and that's exactly what we're going to have today. It's all about change. Um, interaction leading to action. For our improvement initiative and evidence-based agenda today, we're focused on million hearts. That's a given. I mean, it's all <laughs> evidence-based. Um, and we're convening today more representation than I anticipated, and I couldn't be happier about that. Um, I have only listed the HHI regional managers, QIO staff, and Healthy Hot Springs. I didn't realize that we were going to have um, many more uh, components to this, and I'm just pleased. It, we will do knowledge transfer and sharing of best practice, and our best practice today is um, Lejean, who will represent Healthy Hot Springs. And I, I do want to just brag on that just real briefly. Healthy Hot Springs was the first citywide launch in the whole nation. And so we couldn't be more proud. And it's a model that we want you all to pay attention to and embrace. And please, please interrupt her, ask questions. I've already gotten permission from her. And uh, she encourages that as well. The CMS Learning and Action Network uh, National Coordinating Center kind of heads up a lot of activities for the individual state lands uh, across our country. And they selected a honeycomb and a honeybee to symbolize a learning and action network. Honeybees hold a clear, mutually understood mission that embodies teamwork. Their ultimate goal encompasses effective communication and collaboration to keep that hive living. The honeybee communities, uh, communicates through a waggle dance, and we've all kind of seen that, um, that speaks to the need for more resources. This request inspires collective action that positively impacts the entire colony. Lands should foster an environment that captures the honeybee mentality. Their focus is on creating a collaborative, action-driven structure that can be pollinated and shared across health care settings. Lands facilitate the sharing of knowledge, resources, and utilize quality improvement methodologies to achieve better patient care, better patient and population health, and cost, lower cost through improvement. We know historically that didactic learning is ineffective. Peer-to-peer -peer knowledge transfer and sharing does work. And that is the whole purpose of having a learning and action network. I would challenge each of you to kind of embrace the honeybee mentality when implementing change within your regions. We hope that this is one of many lands uh, each of you will participate. And thank you for coming. And next in line is Jen Schuler who for any, anyone that entered a little bit late, uh, Jen is an, a nurse practitioner with Arkansas Cardiology. All right, good morning again. My name is Jennifer Schuler. I'm a nurse practitioner at Arkansas Cardiology. Um, I've shared this lecture a few times, but never to health professionals, always to community groups. So I tend to be very informal. I love questions. I've been a nurse for 11 years, and I would love to tell you anything you'd like to know, but I would like to stay on topic at least until we finish the slides. Um, so my topic today is about the Million Hearts Initiative, and then we'll go through a few of the very basic, everything I'm going to talk about today is very basic. These are 
Public Health 101. These are things you can tell anyone and they're structured in a way that most of my groups have been senior citizens. Um, that even if you're hearing impaired, you can still take my message home, even though I talk a lot. So the Million Hearts Initiative um, is a national initiative that wants, that seeks to prevent a million heart attacks and strokes by the year 2017. Uh, it's co-led by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and CMS. Um, there are several partners with this initiative. They are the National Institutes of Health, Agency for Healthcare Research, and the Quality and, um, and the Food and Drug Administration. There are lots of private sectors that are also trying to spread the message, such as the American Heart Association and the YMCA. And in Arkansas, we've identified um, partners of my practice, the Arkansas Cardiology and the Arkansas Foundation for Medical Care, which is hosting today. So our purpose is we want to educate um, everyone about the Million Hearts Initiative, everyone from um, my senior citizen groups to public health to floor nurses, because this message can be carried by anyone. And in my profession, we call it a lot an elevator pitch. I don't know if anyone else does that a lot. I think it's a business term. This is something you can tell somebody about in an elevator and go on, and it can positively impact their health. So this is my message today. Anybody think they can remember that? Okay. So it's the ABCs. I have a three-year-old. She could probably give this speech. <laughs> so the very first thing is appropriate aspirin therapy. This is something I encourage patients and providers to discuss with their healthcare provider because there are many theories out there right now about should you take an 81 milligram aspirin? Should you take a 325? Should you take two 81 milligram aspirins twice a day? You know, there's Facebook things going rampant about when you should drink water to prevent a heart attack. So this is something I feel is very personal between you and your physician with your medical history in mind. Most of my patients are on a daily 325 aspirin. Now, that's because my practice is electrophysiology. If we have been, if my physician has been inside someone's heart poking around with catheters, they have a long-term risk of clot. And after they finish their appropriate anticoagulation therapy, depending on age and their CHAD score, then we switch them to a 325 aspirin for life, unless they have a major GI bleed. So as far as me being able to recommend to you specifically, it's personal. <laughs> Go to your doctor, ask your doctor. But most people should be on an aspirin unless they are allergic, especially if they have a family history of heart disease or if they have personal history of heart disease. <clears throat> the second thing, B, is blood pressure control. The guidelines on this change all the time. The guidelines we're currently using say a non-diabetic, our goal is less than 140 over 90. This is over a two week period. I have my patients map their blood pressure several times a day. I don't wanna know what it is every day at 8 a.m. when they take their medicines at 9 a.m. That doesn't help me. I wanna know what it is several times a day. If they have one reading or two readings in two weeks over 140, I'm not gonna change their medications because a big part of my practice is seniors who have passed out and end up with pacemakers because they were over medicated for blood pressure. So again, something that's very personal, but that's our general guideline. If a person is diabetic, we do less than 130 over 90, and that's to help with their overall cardiovascular risk factor. Again, I, my practice is two week period, random times a day. I want the log, mail it to me, fax it to me, email it to me. I wanna review it, talk to you about it, and I wanna know when you took your medicines before I change anything. Um, something I've run into a lot in our senior population is over medication of blood pressure, people trying to meet their goals without adequate information. Um, I think everyone, normally I wear my lab coat for this presentation and then I take it off and watch everybody's blood pressure go down. Um, <laughs> I don't ever take patients' blood pressure when they walk in the room and sit down. I wait the full five minutes. I visit with them, I get to know them. Taking their blood pressure is part of their physical exam in my practice because I take my own patients back, I don't have a nurse. So that is just some, some pearls of wisdom I can give you from my practice. The third thing is cholesterol control, and I've got a slide coming up on that that you can take home with reference. And this is um, changes all the time again, but when most people talk about cholesterol, they're talking about their total cholesterol, and we would like that number to be less than 200. 
Now we've got our LDL and our HDL. The way I was taught to learn that was highly desirable and lowly desirable. That's not what it actually means, but that's what your way you can explain it to your patients in your elevator pitch or in your encounters with them. Um, an appropriate use of a statin. Um, our EPIC at Baptist Medical Center makes you order a statin on every patient unless you put in a reason why not, which I think is a great quality initiative that has trickled down all the way through our EMR. So, but I spend a lot of time putting in no and why, but it's documented. And then the last thing, and this is something I had a long fight with a patient yesterday about, is smoking cessation. Now, this, this little gentleman is a 73-year-old man. He's very stubborn. He loves me. He is on my top five people that I would want to come and visit me that day. Mary's mother is on that list as well. Um, but he can only do one thing at a time. So we have done a list together of the things he has got to do. He went to his sleep study, but he refused his CPAP. And his doctor called and tattled on him to me because he knew I would crack the whip at him. So <clears throat> we've gone through this. He has had an AFib ablation. He was in sinus rhythm yesterday. We danced and I printed him out an EKG to put on his refrigerator. We all need to put things on our refrigerator when we do good, okay? So yesterday I had to get on to him because he had a CT scan and it showed he has emphysema already. He's a 50 pack year smoker. So yesterday we had to have the long talk of the next thing on his list is to stop smoking. I'm going to send him to a pulmonologist because of his severity of his emphysema and he does have a hyalur node which is near the heart that could be a precursor to cancer that they've not been able to test at this point. And we had to have the, okay, this is your next goal. I said, I'm going to make your appointment for six weeks from now because all, all they're going to do if you walk in right now is tell you to stop smoking and I'll tell you that for free. So we talked about agents to help quit. A lot of people are vaping now. Y'all seen that? E-cigarettes. I love walking into my patient's room at Baptist. They're smoking their e-cig. No. I'm just waiting on all the data to come back on how bad that is for you. Um, but we had a very long talk and he decided to try patches. Make sure if you recommend patches to somebody, they take them off at night because they will have nightmares and they will hate you. Has anyone tried patches? Be honest with me. Okay, well, if you, if you, don't, if you wear your patch all night, you have nightmares and you feel like you're on LSD or something. Let, let your little people take their patches off. All right, so to get a little more formal, we'll go back to um, some of the guidelines that you can take back with you. So smokers risk is two to four times that of non-smokers. Now the patient I was referring to is very lucky. He does not have coronary disease. He has atrial fibrillation, but he's at high risk, very high risk. But at this point, I'm worried about his lungs because we've got him back into rhythm. His stroke risk is de decreased, but um, anyone who smokes two to four times that is non-smokers. So we've got to encourage people to quit smoking by whatever means possible and support them and give them resources. I have, I cannot count on both hands how many of my patients have brought me forms from 1-800-QUIT-NOW to sign where they get free treatment. They just have to call the number and if they qualify, they bring me a form and they get free patches. If you do, do nothing else to your friends and family who smoke, just tell them to call 1-800-QUIT-NOW and talk to a counselor. And people like me, I party when I get those forms. I'm pumped. I'm ready. We talk about what day they're going to quit. I tell them in six months when you come in, I'm going to get you if I wrote you for free patches and you didn't quit. Um, so we want to decrease our cardiovascular risk with that. <clears throat> the next thing is your breakdown of your numbers for our blood cholesterol. Now everybody gets really excited about triglycerides. Triglyceride therapy is very important, but it's very expensive. If we can get people's cholesterol as soon as possible and get them on a medication if they need it or help them with healthy lifestyle, we can avoid putting them on Lovazo, which is about $700 out of pocket for triglyceride. If we could just diet and exercise, we'd get rid of so many pills, people. I'm speaking to myself as well. High blood pressure. I told you about my guidelines. Again, this is something personal, but when you have high blood pressure over a long period of time, your heart is gonna get weak. It's gonna thicken 
and then it's going to get weak and we're going to end up with heart failure. When you end up with heart failure, you come to see me and get your defibrillator put in. I love defibrillators. They're fabulous. But if we could just get people's blood pressure controlled, they don't need defibrillators. My boss might cry a little. His income will go down some, but I would love to see less people with defibrillators. So the way this has been explained to me is it's like a rubber band. You can only pull a rubber band so many times. So the less pressure you put on it, the better it does long term. I mean, we're all eventually going to get heart failure, but you don't want it when you're 50. You don't want to be the man I discharged yesterday, he's 59, having VTAC all the time. I have to give him oral lidocaine, which makes you feel sick as snot. He's one of those that my loving people who has my cell phone number because he gets shocked all the time. He always tries to explain it. I was working on the car. Was it on? If it wasn't on, it was you. And then he'll call and, and he'll say, well, but I want to work. Well, I want you to work too, but you got to stop getting shocked. You got to take your medicine. So I don't want any of you to come see me. Don't come see me. I love defibrillators, they're fabulous. I don't want any of you to have one. If any of you already have one, you can come see me and I'll help you. Physical inactivity. I'm guilty. After I've worked all day, I really like to sit down and play on Facebook. <laughs> I really don't like watching Mickey Mouse Clubhouse seven times, but that's what my <laughs> three-year-old wants to do. But it's just part of our American life right now. But the more we can move, the better we can do. A lot of companies, my company just started um, initiatives to try to get all of us healthier. We had a health screening last week. We're getting an incentive. They won't tell us what it is, but if we do two walks this year, go to several classes and go get on that Tanita scale and let them measure our wastes again, we get an incentive. Okay. I know right now Steve has his robot phone, that's what my daughter calls his pedometer, and he's trying to beat all you people <laughs> taking steps right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm about to start beating him back. Yep. I'm going to order me one, I'm ready, because I walk a lot in that hospital. Obesity and overweight. I'm talking to myself here, people, and all of us. We all eat bad. Help your patients. Help yourself. Do what you can grow a garden, do something. But anyone who's got excess body fat around the waist is very likely to have heart disease. I count myself. My whole family has heart disease. I don't want it. I have to do better. So diabetes. Diabetes, 65% of people with diabetes have something wrong with their heart too. I'm taking allergy shots right now. I don't want to take a shot every day for the rest of my life. So I'm finally going to do something about it. Prevention is the goal of my talk today. I do a lot of trying to clean up on the back end. I want to prevent. That's why I took the day off for y'all. Stop smoking. Eat better. Get up. Walking is the best exercise. My patients all come to me with their sling on after they get their fibril and go, can I exercise? Yes. Go walk. If you're scared to go walk outside, walk in your house. My grandparents used to walk around their wall in their house 45 minutes every day, like this, in their house. They're 93 and 87, and they're still at home. Should my grandfather be at home? Probably not, but until two years ago, he was golden. Lower your cholesterol. Make sure you're getting it checked every year. What I'm seeing a lot in my practice is my patients like to lie to me until I beat them. And I do. They tell me their primary care checked it and they won't let me check it. Or they tell their primary care that I checked it because they don't want to have to pay more for their medicine. Catch these people. Tell them to bring the copy with them if they don't want to get stuck or they're getting stuck. Lower your blood pressure. All of us could deal to have a little bit better balanced life. Do whatever it takes. You only get one life, only get one body. If you don't take good care of it now, you won't have a good, good time later. Reduce your stress. Preaching to the choir here, people. I stayed till 6.30 coding a patient last night. Not fun. I was in the OR with her when they cracked her chest, figured out one of her lines opened completely up with her heart valve. Reduce your stress. 
I probably should have walked out, but I wanted to be there because the heart team wasn't there yet, and that doctor was throwing a fit, and I was pulling stuff and throwing it at people, and I didn't even know what I was doing. I had my hat, my mask on, but you've got to reduce your stress. However, it helps you. I escape into Kindle. I love that thing. When my child goes to bed, I go to Narnia or Hogwarts or wherever I can go to get off stress. Do something nice for yourself. I see a lot of patients who are on antidepressants for syncope who would have never done anything nice for themselves. And I will tell them their homework is to go to get a manicure. Do something nice for yourself. You've got to reduce your stress. Limit your alcohol. And please don't lie to people like me about it. <laughs> I had somebody lie to me this week and I had to go fight with him and we were, th <laughs> it was bad. Limit. Now I have lots of patients who come in and go, I heard on the internet you can have two glasses of wine every day. I say, well, the internet is not a good doctor and it depends on you. If you're on medicines that interfere with alcohol, uh-uh. If you're not on medicines that interfere with alcohol, because <laughs> it'll help with the things above that. And the last thing, please listen to your doctor or nurse practitioner. We love you. We want the best for you. We don't want your money. We got plenty of people who are sick. Please help us take better care of you by telling us the truth, bringing us your medicine list, and don't lie about who drew your blood. So <clears throat> the end of my talk is some resources for you. Of course, the first thing is the website to my practice. If you live in Little Rock or any of the areas we go to, we're happy to see you, happy to see your patients come and see us. We don't uh, exclude Medicare beneficiaries or any of those ugly things that I've heard people talk about. We love our patients. We treat them like they're our family. That's why we're a small practice and why most people never heard of us. We're housed over medical towers too. We're above the rehab hospital. At 10 doctors, three nurse practitioners in Little Rock, four doctors in North Little Rock. Five now, sorry, I don't ever go over there. Um, AFMC, these people are doing a great job by bringing people like me to come talk to you, tell you good things to tell your patients, tell you really simple things to tell your patients. Because the simple things of prevention are the key. And then the Million Hearts campaign, you can read more about what spurred this campaign. I've got some research with me if you'd like it, but they went through and it's part of Healthy People 2020 and they're gonna measure it. They've got a place for healthcare providers, nurses to go on and sign the pledge that they will take better care of themselves or they'll take better care of their patients online so they can kind of track some outcomes. And then of course the American Heart Association where I go if I have a question because the guidelines change every day. Any burning questions? Yes, ma'am. I just heard the tail end of this, and I think you might have alluded to it a little bit. Uh, on one of the news, morning news shows, I thought I understood to say there was some medical debate now about older patients and their blood pressure medicine weighing the pros and cons because of falls. Yes. How many of them are passing out? Is that over medication, or is it just kind of germane to certain medicines that you tend to? Um, a lot of it that I've seen in my practice is over medication when we get someone in from another practice or somebody who, who really doesn't like having puffy ankles decides to take some extra diuretics. Um, a lot of it that I have noticed in our seniors is that they have gotten older and frailer and have lost a significant amount of weight but they still take the pills they took 10 years ago. And um, since our practice is electrophysiology, which is pacemakers, defibrillators, rhythm disorders, we get called 91, 94, 97 year olds all the time that have passed out or fallen at home. And we either find a rhythm disorder, over medication, or dehydration is very common. Older people, especially my grandfather, don't want to drink anything because they don't want to get up and walk because they don't want to fall. Like, literally, my grandfather is on a fluid schedule. They bring him a coffee cup of fluid every 30 minutes to make him drink it because he like, likes to not drink anything all day long because he doesn't want to have to go to the bathroom because he doesn't want to fall. So he goes in the hospital with low sodium and pneumonia every couple months now. But until he was 90, when he was 90, he came up and saw me at UAMS when I birthed my child. Now, 90 year olds walking that campus is hard work, but he came, she was born on his 90th birthday, so he had to come. But just to see his decline has really made me passionate about not over medicating 
encouraging adequate fluid. And those people are so scared of salt. We have terrified these people of salt <laughs> because of high blood pressure. And I tell them to eat all salt they want. <laughs> It'll raise their blood pressure. It'll make them hold on to some fluid. They won't pass out. They won't fall. I met a lady a couple weeks ago who had a new onset AFib, fell and broke her hip. Came in, got it fixed, went home, fell again. This time they figured out it was AFib. We've got to have specialists that are not heart doctors looking for reasons that people fall. And didn't they recently, and you even said the guideline like a 140 over 90, whereas before they had it much lower. Over 80. Yeah. And I think for older people too, I, I know I deal with my aunt has uncontrolled hypertension pretty much. And they had her on so many meds. Uh, and it just seemed like once we finally found one doctor who was more proactive, she was getting the same results with half the meds. So. Right. And a lot of that, too, is, is education of patients at home to take their blood pressure and to not take it an hour before they take their pills. Because it's always going to be high and they're going to go home with a new prescription. And a lot of people don't take the time to figure that out. My patient load is very light because I'm mostly round in the hospital. I can't imagine the burden put on, you know, I went to nursing school in Northeast Arkansas. You know, the burden on those physicians is just ridiculous. There's not enough physicians to take care of the patients. They don't have time to hunt them down and see what their blood pressure was for the last two weeks. They look at the guideline, they look at what's going to get them soothed, and they write a pill. And it's not because they're bad doctors, it's because they're trying to do evidence-based medicine, but patients are suffering. Well, and that's the other thing, I mean, I've heard, I forget who it was, at one of these conferences, someone, or maybe at a video conference, that if doctors would actually take a prescription pad and write, walk 30 minutes a day, how many chronic diseases could be improved, the outcomes could be improved, instead of just writing a prescription all the time. And I think a lot of it too, probably people in the hurry. But do doctors, is there more focus now in medical school on the prevention end? Like I know, I don't know now, is there much nutrition education in medical school? Or? I can't speak to medical school, but I can speak to practitioner school. <laughs> And uh, we definitely were taught very intensely about prevention. We were required um, to develop a program um, using research of what we would do with no resources in a rural area. We were assigned a county, told to research the county, figure out the health problems in the county, and what we would do about it with no money. And my county was Chico County. Anybody from Chico County? All right, love y'all. <laughs> I'm so glad they're growing a garden down there now. That was not part of my plan. My plan was to get together um, African American women ages 30 to 49 for a walking group for 12 weeks with nutrition classes. We were going to go walk because I had no money in my theoretical class. But we had to do that in nurse practitioner school. That was required for graduation and we had to present